Uh, we start by uh, acknowledging that we are on, gathering today on a traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Muslim people. And uh, you will, I introduce here uh, Ms. Uh, Monique Rodriguez, uh, who is Brazilian and participate, uh, is a student of journalists, a master journalist, uh, and she will introduce you to the other players in, uh, in a major program that has involved uh, lots of people in to this university, and uh, including uh, some people in our, as you will hear. Um, go ahead. Well, thanks, Professor Pauli. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for making all the way here in this snowy Friday. Uh, thanks again uh, to the Institute uh, for the Oceans and Fisheries, Fisheries as well for hosting us today here. Uh, as Daniel Pauli said, my name is Monique Rodriguez. Uh, I'm a graduate uh, from UBC's Graduate School of Journalism uh, and an alum of the Global Reporting Program. And I was one of the students uh, who joined this investigation last year. Uh, and this included spending two weeks doing some uh, reporting in Peru. Uh, we'll first uh, see two videos. It, it's a two-part, actually, a video that we published in partnership with NBC, just so you have a better understanding of what our reporting was. Uh, and then later we'll uh, start the, the Q&A with our uh, panelists here today. So thanks very much. In Jawal, Senegal, locals catch fish the same way they have for generations in colorful handmade canoes carted to shore in rickety horse-drawn carriages. Dudu Kote has been fishing these waters his whole life. He says lately many of the fish caught here are now being sold to Chinese-owned fish meal processing factories that have popped up along the West African coast. There's growing demand for these little fish to be turned into fish meal destined for fish farms in China and around the world. Fish eat fish. This is bead to grow farmed fish. Quite simply, people need food, and this is a very efficient way of producing proteins. The raw material for fish meal production comes from stocks of fish, which if they were not harvested and made into fish meal, would just swim around the ocean unused. So they're a renewable natural resource. But there's a dark side to that efficiency, as we discovered in an investigation conducted in partnership with students from the Global Reporting Program. You know the idea that farmed fishing was supposed to help reduce the impact on the environment from wild fishing? Well, that hasn't exactly worked out the way people thought it would. There are some hidden costs. For example, a quarter of the fish that's caught out in the wild is actually fed back into farmed fish. It's made into powder that looks like this. And some experts warn this is having a dire impact on the environment. There is a growing demand for fish, big fish, more people are eating fish. Yeah, more people are eating fish, and big fish are always carnivores. Therefore, it generates an immense demand for fish meal. Aquaculture does not reduce the pressure on fisheries, and actually, it increases it. Dr. Daniel Pauly, one of the world's leading fishery scientists, says that's because it can take hundreds of wild fish to make a single farmed fish. What is siphoning off all the small fish like the anchovy and the sardines due to the rest of the food chain? When you go after the forage fish, you destroy the ecosystem. And you can forget about having marine mammals because they depend on forage fish as well. Seabirds also depend on that. So basically, the entire ecosystem, they all go. And this collapse has happened in some places like California. This collapse has indeed happened and California is a legendary example. Throughout the early part of the 20th century, the waters off California were one of the most productive sardine fisheries in the world, with most of the fish destined for fish meal plants. This pressure for fish meal wiped out a thriving industry. So the fishery essentially disappeared. A half century later, the same thing is happening in the South China Sea, where some of its own fisheries 
are on the verge of collapse. At the port of Boha in southern China, many of the fish hauled in are juveniles that have not had a chance to reproduce. And with China, the largest processor of farmed fish in the world, many fishermen here say the hungry appetite for fish meal is putting the entire Chinese fishing industry at risk. The art fishery is a disaster. China has reached that stage in the domestic water. They ground up everything and use the fish for aquaculture. So China has had to expand well beyond its own waters to feed its growing industry, building a fish meal empire that spans the globe. 10,000 miles away along the Pacific coast of Peru, China has helped develop the largest fish meal industry in the world. China has become the major importer of fish meal from Peru because Peru has immense quantity of anchovies that are all turned into fish meal. Several tons of anchovies every year end up in one of dozens of fish meal plants in Peru. Las fábricas se instalaron aquí justamente. El color de las aguas era en realidad turquesa. Biologist Romulo Luiza says waste from the fish meal industry has killed off the bay and the way of life here. Ajay. El lodo huele a huevos podridos. This mud is made up of rotting fish bones, scales, and blood, which poured out of the factories for decades until environmental regulations finally banned the practice. Los susefluentes eran descargados directamente aquí dentro de la bahía del Ferrol. ¿no? Eso perturbó violentamente las características físicas, químicas y biológicas del agua y del fondo de la bahía, que hicieron de que casi toda la La, la riqueza biológica que teníamos prácticamente desapareciera. Yo de, de pequeñito nos íbamos a la playa este, y sacábamos muy muyes, sacábamos moluscos, los chimbotanos ligados a su mar. Y eso es lo que se ha roto. To feed the growing demand for fish meal, China has expanded into West Africa. China has built fish meal plants that export the fish. And we are talking about fish that otherwise people in West Africa would eat. And this is the only fish they can afford to eat. Sardine is a staple of the diet here in Senegal. And many locals, like fish processor Marianne Tenning Jai, are upset about these foreign-owned plants. On est dans un pays sous-développé. Nous n'avons rien. Or que les Chinois ont de l'argent, nous nous n'avons pas de moyens. Il prend le poisson direct à la mer et il transforme ça là-bas. Lax environmental regulations allow some factories here to pour fish meal waste right onto the beach. We tested the murky outflow from this factory in Joal, Senegal and what we found were dangerously high levels of several heavy metals. In places like Senegal, people have complained about respiratory illnesses. The global reporting fellows in the field took samples of effluent and they found really toxic levels of pollutants. That's a general problem of enforcement of regulation. If you allow a factory 
to have effluent that contain toxic levels, you are negligent. It sounds to me like maybe regulation is not quite as effective as it could be. So if the regulation is not in place, we're very interested in looking to see what can be done. In neighboring Gambia, three fish meal factories have recently been built on this tiny country's 50-mile coastline. When this Chinese-owned plant laid a pipe into the water, local activists like Abdu took matters into their own hands. This factory is making people sick. And the village said they don't want it, so we went there to close it. We are fighting against the factory. Fighting by digging up the pipeline. But the fish meal factory has since resumed operation. There's a fair amount of resistance in West Africa, people sabotaging the factories. Does it surprise you that people are opposed to these factories which create jobs? Not only am I not surprised, but I'm, I'm surprised that they even could build those things because they are contrary to all the interests of the country. At the end, you will see nothing here. There will be no nature, there will be no trees, there will be no people because we cannot live. What is it you want people to walk away with after watching a story like this? One thing is when eating a farm fish, that they think about where the fish meal comes from. And the, the second thing is not repeat this silly notion that aquaculture will save the world and diminish the pressure on fisheries. It doesn't. We investigated the global fish meal industry in partnership with NGC News. These were the two videos published on their website. Uh, we also have uh, our own website with more content, more, uh, more uh, videos that you can access later. Uh, this project explored the three nodes of the, or three nodes of the fish meal supply chain, the growing demand from China, uh, where most of the world's fish farm operates, the growing supply from Peru, which is the largest producer of fish meal and increasing resistance to the industry by coastal communities in West Africa. And just to give you a little bit of uh, context about the Global Reporting Program, so the Global Reporting Program, or GRP as we call it, brings together students from around the world to investigate on their favorite issues. It has grown out of, uh, out of a successful course at the Graduate School of Journalists called the International Reporting Program in which students travel uh, overseas to practice international reporting. The new format of the class, which uh, we started last year, offers opportunities to students from journalism, quality, and other academic departments to collaborate on global investigations. The students study the issue for one term, do field reporting for two weeks, and then spend uh, another term working to create impactful works of journalism in partnership with major media organizations. Uh, today, we'll hear from three people that were also immersed in the, on the investigation, as I was. Uh, first, Peter Klein. Uh, Peter Klein is an Emmy Award winning journalist and professor at the BBC Graduate School of Journalism, where he was director of the school from 2011 to 2015. He's also the founding director of the Global, Cent of the Global Reporting Center at UBC, which is dedicated to researching and producing global journalism. Uh, Professor uh, Peter Klein leads graduate students on international reporting projects, which have partnered with major media organizations and have won a long list of major journalism awards that include an Emmy Award for Best Investigation, uh, an Edward R. Murrow Award, and a uh, Canadian Association of Journalists Award. In addition to the Emmy, he won uh, with his UBC students, where Klein himself won. Uh, and Emmy for his 16-minute investigation with Mike Wallace into the former Soviet Union's smallpox weapons program and shared an Emmy for a documentary about global health. He's a regular contributor to the New York uh, Times Future Report uh, series and a longtime producer at CBC News uh, 60 Minutes. He's also a faculty uh, associate at the UBC School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming.
Our next guest is Caroline Graham, who is a Master of Science student in the Oceans and Fisheries program here at UBC and holds a BA in Biology from Grinnell College in the USA. She had the opportunity to be involved in the Global Reporting Program with the Ocean Leaders Program at UBC, where she investigated the fishery industry in China. Her current research focuses on understanding marine salmon ecology in the North Pacific, while previous work has ranged from studying the effects of climate change on coral to bacterial growth on microplastics in the open ocean, as well as understanding the agents of seaweed in the Caribbean. So please uh, welcome Caroline. And our third guest is Thomas Smith. Uh, he, he is a Master of Science student at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries and an Ocean Leaders Fellow, who is supposed to provide by Drs. Jordan Rosenthal and Brian Hunt, with a family history rooted in Canadian fisheries and many summers spent as a canoe trip guide. He is interested in the relationship between river dwelling fish and the dynamics of their aquatic environment. Focusing on juvenile Pacific salmon, his goal is to help improve the management of these ecologically, economically, and socially vital species in the face of the climate change and an increasing global population. Thomas was a 2018 Global Reporting Program Fellow, have, helping investigate the role of the international fishing industry in post, coastal West African communities. So please welcome uh, Thomas. <laughs> Model, you know, outside is going in 
So yeah, I guess the, the big reason why we joined, why I joined Project Advisor was presented to uh, myself and the other ocean leaders by Simon Donner at the beginning of this course. And it seemed like a very interesting opportunity. Um, I know when you're in sciences, through education, you learn a very specific way of communicating and approaching problems. And I was just very interested in learning from students with other backgrounds how they approach these problems and how they communicate their findings. So, more just getting a kind of broadening my perspective of the real guy. And then also when we found out we could possibly be going overseas, that was also a really cool part. Yeah, so similarly, similarly to Thomas, um, this idea was presented to us through the Ocean Leaders program. Um, and I personally uh, was really interested in the opportunity to get involved in this outside of my own and learn from other students. I've always been interested in science communication, and um, this seems like the perfect opportunity to get involved with that. Um, it was a great experience. Oh, yeah. It was a great experience. Um, yeah, but it actually wasn't that fun. No, it was really good, actually. Um, honestly, I was really, I didn't know what to expect at all going into it. Um, I didn't know too much what to expect, and just through the whole process from the planning to being in the field to the writing up and whatnot, I was just really blown away by kind of the past and the drive of a lot of the journalism students in the class. And um, for myself, I guess the personal experience being in the field, um, I ended up taking on a bit of a photographer role and I got to be mentored by um, very lovely Aranash. And just learning how photographers navigate a landscape was a 
began just helping out with the, the design, the layout of the website. Uh, we wanted to make it interactive in a way that would um, really draw in the users. So uh, that, that was about that. It was, it was very diverse overall. What it comes to contributions to the field, and something we never sort of thought of doing, was you know, all these different people were saying different things, and we actually go into the ocean. We see some studies in other parts of the world um, that uh, suggested that there are some things that have been following from the exposure to that thing. Um, so, but the question is, what's the English document that stuff is going on? Um, and so, you were all kind of glorified. Again, we really we kind of defer to students, um, and we're still in this location, guiding you guys, whenever we can. But we, you know, this is your project, and we, and we want to empower the students to, to take a lead and um, decide. And you, you all did your research to make your argument, but for you, it's the largest supplier, so that was different. I don't know how these things go. Um, but that's sort of what's obvious. Um, if not, if you look at the you know, number of places uh, in the of the world, Volume of production of this film wasn't all that significant, but it's emerging. I mean, it's different. There was local pushback. Maybe it's some sort of kind of violent activity or something. Um, so that seems to be interesting. Uh, I'm thinking of this China as the largest um, uh, consumer and kind of, you know, most of the world's uh, agricultural facilities are in China. Um, but it's the China is the largest producer of agriculture in the world. So that was sort of a natural place to be. That was it. That always made a difference. Yeah, well, and that's what we're doing about this. We're doing a lot of work in
So, yeah, I guess that is the whole of us asking you one of the big things that we did witness in regards to the community kind of resistance against, against the people factories was, um, so two of the members, Abby and Dustin, they actually headed to the Gambia and covered what was going on in the community in the Spanish language, which is a lot of our position to the Fishmeal factory there. And that's when we saw the video clip where they're going to pouring the pipe out of there, and that conflict's been going on there for quite a while. Um, but for myself, uh, I spent time down in Pathmos region, which is just south of the Gambia. So just thinking about um, the geography of Canada, it's the most western tip of the African continent. But then, kind of standing straight in the middle of the country is the Gambia. So, at the southern region of the Gambia, or the southern region of Senegal, um, we spent time in this community of Bene, and there's a lot of opposition there um, coming from the youth against the countries there. And we had the opportunity to actually sit in with those um, kind of little organizations of youth uh, are discussing this issue and how they're wanting to kind of deal with it. So, one thing that and just hearing a lot from the people about the impact these factories have, um, and one of the issues is there's these big trucks that are coming in to pull the fish meal out of there, and the roads in these communities aren't really built for big trucks like that, so it's actually tearing up the roads. So these, these factories are really coming in, they're coming from foreign countries, and they're actually making an impact, it seems like, on the infrastructure within the community. So it's, yeah, it's interesting too, because not everybody in the community as opposed to against it, there was a lot of conflict there, and we noticed even in the Grenada, there's conflict within families, within people of the same generation. So it is quite a complex um, issue here within communities. It's not, it's not all the communities are against it or all for it. It really depends on, it depends on how, kind of, what people could get out of it personally, what was being taken away. focus on the resistance so to speak, um, but we also didn't do it. Um, there are, so there are up to people, people um, in creating working communities in China, um, and they are working on campaigns to um, combat these disruptive fishing practices. Um, but as far as sort of community resistance, we didn't see it as much. Um, most but mostly we were talking to um, we were talking to um, people who own agriculture farms, so this is their livelihood. Thank you so much for your presentation. May I ask your advice about what we can do here in British Columbia? As you may know, salmon farms have been outlawed by by 2025, but many people think that that's too long because governments may change and they may change that policy. And so a group of us are putting pressure on governments to start eliminating the fish farms tomorrow, immediately, and, and to set up a schedule of eliminating them, because it's rather vague saying they'll be out by 2025. I wonder what you would recommend as um, anything that you have produced from your research that we could share with people that we are trying to, you know, persuade to stop salmon farming in British Columbia? Do you have documents? Do you have? I mean, what what do you have besides films that that we could share with uh, with politicians to convince them? Um, I think the first thing to address is actually probably looking at the fish farms that are operating in British Columbia waters and seeing where the fish meal is coming from. I know there is a governing, or there's the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, which um, they make sure that all the ingredients, whether it's the fish meal, are being sustained. So if it's the fish meal, if the fisheries that are producing that fish meal are being sustainably harvested. Um, now, I'm not too sure on what the social component is of the sustainability in making that certification, but I think most importantly, um, if we're wanting to draw any evidence from what we've witnessed, say, in West Africa, it would be first of all 
addressing if there is a link between what's going on there and that fish meal production with what's actually being produced in British Columbia. But I still think it is important to um, really understand that when we are taking these fisheries, yeah, from uh, from West Africa, we're, we're really taking food sources from the local communities there. Um, it's not very fair when you think about it. Um, it. I know in the graph there only, I think, I found it was just over 120 or 140 fish were um, used to produce a four kilogram salmon, which isn't a high amount of fish. And of course, the wild salmon is going to be eating that when it's swimming around in the ocean. But the issue here is that what we're doing is we're taking those fish from another part of the world and from other from starving communities and transferring that to better developed countries. So it's, I think, making that link could be important, but I also think it's extremely important that we, that the fish meal is coming from those countries if we're using that as evidence. That's. I've been working with Patricia not to look a little bit on, I think probably in Peru you were associating with her. One of the things I just wanted to point out while we're talking about it is this is the benign side of fish meal production. The, re the atrocious side of fish meal production, and I'm not dismissing what you're saying at all, is the bottom trawling that has now become annihilation trawling. So we are now dropping nets, scraping the bottom with no target species in mind, and pulling up the product of that, processing into fish meal, fish oil, with no end point in sight. There are no natural protocols at all. And Patricia and I are comparing and contrasting this rather a lot. China, India, Thailand, all over the world, we're going in now to annihilation trawling. And Peter, referring to your comment, many of these trawl vessels are crewed by either slave labor or by indentured labor. So, you know, as we take this story forward, I really encourage you, Peter, but also just all of the advocates on this, to keep in mind this, what you're showing us, is the benign side of reduction fishery, appalling as this is. And then also, I'd like to get a strong sense of, you know, you all talk about this in a rather um, objective way, which is laudable in a particular academic environment. For God's sake, we've got to get serious about this. So I want to know whether it inflamed any passion in you to effect change and how you're going to do that. <laughs> Let me say, before you get to passion, uh, um, I will say, you know, you're right, there's, there's a much bigger story here. In fact, at one point we thought about getting into the krill, which is another whole other aspect that, that is quite serious. Um, and, and the trawling, um, there, there, some, there were some risks in reporting on the trawling um, and the slavery aspects. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's, we scrape the surface of, of this and there's a lot more. A lot more to look at, as well as you know, in terms of aquaculture. I mean, you know, the the, the potential harm of, of aquaculture. This is a small part of it, given that you know the c concerns about about transmission of diseases to wild fish and and, and, and things like that. So uh, we certainly acknowledge that there's a lot more. But um, in terms of passion, I'm 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 dead from all the horrible things I've seen in the world. So I, I you know, I mean, I've been reporting on, on aquaculture for a long time. I did a big, big project on on BC. Uh, salmon farms um, for 60 minutes as well. So, you know, I've been sort of slowly plugging at this this topic, um, slowly seeing some some progress in some places, uh, but then of course, then slide back in other places. I'm curious what you guys think. Yeah. So I'd like to acknowledge what Amanda said about fishery um, about these destructive fishing practices. Um, this is a lot of what we saw in China, as you saw in some of the clips. Um, there are these very large trawlers going out and catching anything in sight. Um, we saw sharks and very large rays in the bycatch. Um, and um, yeah, we also heard from fishers about very destructive practices like using chemicals to kill and catch fish or using electrocution to kill and catch fish. Um, and there doesn't seem to be, uh, uh, it doesn't seem to be very well regulated at this moment, although the Chinese government is starting to think about this and they did implement these um, regulations on size limits, although um, is it working? I'm not sure. Uh, as far as passion goes, I think for me this project um, really made me think about how disconnected we are from our food supply. 
um, that was the biggest takeaway for me. Um, we just have no idea when we're buying a, you know, a frozen tilapia in the supermarket where that came from. Um, and I think um, for me, yeah, it's very important um, to know where food's coming from. And also we need to think about um, where this demand is coming from that's pushing um, aquaculture and fisheries. Uh, people want to eat these large carnivorous fish. Um, they want to eat tuna, they want to eat salmon, they don't eat the anchovies, the herring, um, the sardines. Um, but we need to think about how we can diversify our diets and um, put more value on these lower trophic fish uh, that there are much more of them um, and yeah we don't have to spend a lot of energy uh, producing them so to speak. Thomas, do you have a really quick comment on that? You're running out of time so unfortunately we won't have time for more questions. Um, I guess yeah something I just want to bring up really quickly is something kind of the change the what evoked kind of like passion in me is kind of seeing in West Africa how it's supposed to be seven nautical miles from the coast of Senegal that is restricted for um, artisanal fishing. Um, and what's happening right now is basically foreign factories are coming in and they're placing themselves strategically at fishing ports. And they are then buying all the fish from the artisanal um, fisheries. So. In a way, I think I just witnessed that there seems to be some sneaky behavior on, on the global level of, kind of foreign countries figuring out ways of getting around maybe fishing restrictions. So, uh, for me personally, you know, I'm doing my master's right now on, on, on river ecology, but it still is. I would like to go forward in a way that's understanding kind of the loopholes that, pe that um, people might try to use in order to get profit. So just having that perspective, um, yeah, that's all I can add, really. Yeah. I mean, I, I just want to say one other thing in terms of kind of the value of just going and seeing things. And so discovering, um, in our case, we're looking at the hidden costs. There's so many unintended consequences, um, not just the environmental ones. This this piece you saw here was specific on environment, but the whole website looks broader. But you know, one of the things in West Africa was so interesting was that um, the, the women in, in, in Senegal um, a majority or a significant amount, number of women are are the, the buyers of the fish. So they they have political, economic, social power because they're you know they they kick these fishermen's butts like they, they come over and they I want to sell you this and they're like no go away and you know they have they they, they really have quite a lot of agency because of of their their role in this uh, local economy. Well, as that's being degraded. The role of women is actually changing in these communities. So you know you, things you don't necessarily think about when you go there and you see, you realize how complex and how multi-layered this is. I think that also, you know, not just in, in the people there, but hopefully in in, in the public audiences uh, will will inflame some passion. So we can continue this discussion in 07, in 107, and there will be uh, there will be pizza. Uh, we have to hurry up and get the pizza. Uh, uh, one little thing, since I have the floor, I had not seen the movie. I had not seen that. Uh, the film had been sent to me, but uh, my computer didn't work. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's nice, man. Huh?